Hi everyone, welcome to United Way of Larimer County's Nonprofit Excellence Series event, virtual fundraising events, strategies for success in Larimer County. Um, we're gonna get started here in just about two to three minutes so we can give everybody a chance to log on. Um, but as we are getting started, if everybody could just take a moment to put your name and organization in the chat box, uh, we would love to see who is here with us. All right, great everybody. We are um, going to go ahead and get started. Um, I want to welcome you once again to United Way of Larimer County's Nonprofit Excellence Series event, Virtual Fundraising Events, Strategies for Success in Larimer County. If you are just now joining us, please do take a moment to put your name and organization in the chat box um, so that we can all see who is on the call with us today. So during our webinar today, we're going to be talking with you about how we transitioned one of our largest annual events to a virtual format earlier this summer. We'll be sharing a lot of information that we hope will be very useful for you, um, including doing a general overview of the event itself, including our event concept and goals, um, some budget information and our program strategies, among other things. Um, we'll also cover the logistics of how we pulled everything off from a technical standpoint um, and do a deep dive into those marketing and engagement strategies, as well as our multi-pronged approach to fundraising. Um, finally, we'll go over some lessons that we learned and talk a little bit about what went well um, and what we might do differently next time. And there will also be some time um, at the end for a question and answers. Um, so I know we're all probably pretty familiar with Zoom at this point, um, but really quickly, I just want to ask everyone to use the Q&A box to ask any questions rather than the chat box. Um, this just helps us ensure that we get to everybody's questions and that nothing gets lost in that sea of scrolling, um, which can happen sometimes. So the Q&A box is the place to ask questions, uh, but the chat box is still a great place to communicate with us and the other folks watching. If you have anything to share that is not a question um, you're looking to have answered during our webinar today. 
So before we get started, I do just want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for the nonprofit excellence series, Comcast. Uh, I think we all know that having an internet connection at home is more important than ever. Um, Comcast is providing affordable options for families in Larimer County through their Internet Essentials Program, um, which provides internet service for as little as $9.95 per month. Um, this program has been a really great resource for many of our partner agencies serving clients that qualify for public assistance programs like SNAP and Medicaid. So um, I highly encourage you to hop on over to internetessentials.com to learn a little bit more about that. So without further ado, let's do some quick introductions. I see several folks here that I am fortunate enough to be already acquainted with. Um, but I do see some unfamiliar names as well. So for all you folks, my name is Morgan Vanek, and I am the Senior Nonprofit Excellence Manager and Grant Specialist at United Way of Larimer County. Um, however, this extremely long job title is somewhat new for me. Um, and at the time of the event that we'll be talking about today, uh, my role was much more focused on planning and executing events for United Way. Um, and I'm going to be presenting today alongside my friend and colleague, Jamie Rasmussen, who is our Director of Marketing and Engagement here at United Way. Jamie is an extremely talented marketing professional, and she was an absolutely critical part of making our virtual event successful. She has an incredible wealth of knowledge to share about how to overcome a lot of the challenges that can come along with producing an event like this. Um, so she's going to have some really useful um, and interesting information to share with you. So now that you know who we are, um, let's go ahead and get started with our presentation. So as we are settling in today, we would like to ask everybody on the call um, to take a quick poll and should be seeing that come up on your screen here. Um, obviously, the coronavirus has made it a lot more challenging for nonprofits to host fundraising events. So we are curious to know um, whether your organization has had to cancel an in-person fundraising event uh, because of the pandemic and also whether you've already produced a virtual fundraiser or if you're um, already in the process of planning one for the future. So we'll just give everybody a moment here um, to respond to that poll. All right, looks like most folks here have responded. So it does look like 100% um, of our attendees today have had to cancel an event. Um, you're certainly not alone. And it looks like a lot of you um, have either already done a virtual fundraiser or are planning to, so that's great. Um, really good information for us to know. Um, several months ago, you know, we were in a very similar position to a lot of you. Um, we, like any good superhero legend, I think that the origin story is a pretty critical part of the narrative. Um, so we are going to go back several years and talk about our annual State of the Community Luncheon for just a moment. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with this event, um, which we held every year to celebrate philanthropy and volunteerism in Larimer County. Um, State of the Community was a really great opportunity for us to um, get our stakeholders and supporters together each year, but it really was not intended to be a fundraiser. Um, so although we did sell tickets and solicit for event sponsorships, we were more or less breaking even on this event um, from year to year. But then in 2018, we were getting ready to celebrate our 60th anniversary and our board and our CEO at the time um, really wanted to switch things up and use that year's State of the Community event as an opportunity to generate some revenue for our organization. So we decided to change that event from a luncheon to a cocktail party. And we moved it from our longstanding venue at Embassy Suites in Loveland over to the Lori Student Center at CSU. Um, we increased the prices of our sponsor levels and our tickets pretty significantly and also included a formal fundraising ask as part of that program. And this approach was incredibly successful. Uh, more than 600 people were in attendance for the 60th anniversary celebration, and our net revenue for that event was more than $70,000. So as I'm sure you can imagine, um, our board and executive leadership really wanted to replicate the success of that event. Um, so we started, um, or so we decided to retire our State of the Community event in favor of what we started calling um, the annual social. 
And for the 2020 event, we decided to um, try for a superhero themed cocktail party. You know, we really liked this theme because we felt um, tied in pretty well with our four focus areas of youth and education, um, financial stability, nonprofit excellence, and community engagement. It was also very aligned with our desire to show our donors how much we appreciate and value their generosity. You know, for us, they really are the superheroes of United Way and of our community. Um, so we started planning. We convened a steering committee, um, developed a sponsorship package, and printed up some really cool invitations. But just as we were really starting to pick up steam, um, something happened. And I think we all know what that was. Um, and if you don't, you should probably consider leaving this webinar right now and spending the rest of our time reading the newspaper or something. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm kidding, of course, but um, obviously you all know that I am referring to the coronavirus pandemic. So I won't bore all of you talking about the quote unquote new normal and all of that, um, but when we closed our United Way offices in mid-March and then went on the stay at home order shortly after, this event was really top of mind for our team. Um, we went back and forth over whether we should cancel the event or postpone it. Um, try to move it to a virtual format, or if we should just wait and see how things might shake out. Um, you know, believe it or not, at that time, we were still thinking that it might be possible for us to have a 500 person party in June, um, to which I now look back and say, LOL. Um, but during that time, I was working at home, I was all cozy in my leggings, and I was doing a lot of research into virtual events. Um, this was pretty new territory, you know, not only for us, but for a lot of organizations. We were seeing quite a few nonprofits here in Larimer County canceling their major fundraisers that were scheduled around that time. And after looking into our options, I really started advocating for us to move the event to a virtual format. Um, canceling obviously was not ideal because of the lost revenue and postponing would have made our balance sheet look kind of wonky because our fiscal year ends in June, um, which would have been just a couple weeks after we were planning to host that in-person superhero social. Um, because things were starting to look pretty scary in terms of the spread of the virus, I was also getting pretty skeptical that an in-person event would be a realistic possibility. And I also knew from my research that if we were going to pull off a virtual event successfully, um, we were going to have a lot of work to do preparing for it. And I knew that we could use all the time we could get. So in the end, um, our team decided to make that call earlier rather than later. And that is how the invisible superhero social was born. Now, our goals for this event did shift a little bit um, given the situation with the pandemic. You know, first, we really felt like the meaning of that term community superheroes had taken on a new and sort of more poignant meaning. Uh, we were in the middle of an absolutely unprecedented and frankly terrifying situation. Uh, but we kept seeing all of these incredible healthcare workers and nonprofit staff and volunteers and even just everyday people who were out in our community helping drop off groceries and pick up prescriptions for their neighbors. Um, people were really stepping up and coming together and even though it was a really scary time, um, we were very inspired by those people and we wanted to celebrate these folks through our virtual superhero social. Second, we really wanted to raise awareness about how our organization was responding to the pandemic. Um, as you may or may not be aware, local United Ways typically play a pretty important role during community disasters, and this situation is no exception. Um, our United Way pivoted pretty quickly to tackle some of the most urgent issues that we were facing in the community. Um, we set up a donation drop-off and a pickup site at our building. We started hosting blood drives there as well. Uh, we also hosted a webinar for community members who were interested in volunteering, started working with the county and local municipal governments to become the hub for information and resources in our area. And um, we also partnered with the Community Foundation of Northern Colorado to form the Northern Colorado COVID-19 Response Fund, um, which gave out more than a million dollars in emergency grants to local nonprofits who were helping our community respond to the pandemic. Um, and finally, our last goal, um, we already had a community emergency and response fund um, that we had set up back in 2012 during the High Park Fire. 
Um, so we decided to use our Invisible Superhero Social as an opportunity to help us replenish that fund so we could continue to provide support throughout the pandemic response and recovery process in Larimer County, as well as hopefully having additional financial resources available for any future community disasters that might come our way. So now that you know what we were trying to accomplish through the Invisible Superhero Social, um, we'll share with you how we approached that event and what our results were. First though, I would like to share a video that we played to kick off our event so that you can get a feel for what we were doing. Time and again, our community has come together to address a myriad of challenges, floods, wildfires, and global pandemics have proven to be no match for the philanthropic fighting spirit of Larimer County. And at every turn, United Way is here to connect businesses, individuals, and nonprofits, creating an alliance of invisible superheroes. We know that the power of collaboration, generosity, and kindness strengthens our community. Day after day, year after year, our work proves that in Larimer County, we truly are stronger together as we navigate countless obstacles to meet the needs of our most vulnerable populations. Currently, everyday citizens are jumping into action, contributing their time, talent, and resources to make a difference for their neighbors in a time of unprecedented fear and uncertainty. United Way is leading the charge to address today's greatest needs, and we need your help. Answer the call. Suit up and stand united with us as we work to change lives and strengthen our community. Join our League of Heroes. That's not cool. Um, our videographer that we used uh, is a local guy called Kevin Kirchner, and he is just so talented. I love watching that video every time I see it. Um, and I did see that there is a question here um, in our Q&A box around um, whether or not the recording of this will be available. Um, yes, the recording will be available. We'll be sending out the slides as well um, as a few other handouts that we hope will be helpful for, um, for everyone here. Um, so let's get on to some brass tacks here. Uh, understandably, one of the most common questions we've gotten from other nonprofits about this event um, is around our budget and our expenses. You know, everybody wants to know if um, trying to pull off a virtual event is really going to be worth it. Um, and for us, it definitely was. So first, we'll kind of review our original plan for the in-person event just to provide some context. Um, in terms of revenue, we were budgeting to bring in about $110,000 from three primary sources, um, sponsorships, ticket sales, and individual contributions. That is a lot of money, but at United Way, we are fortunate to have a resource development department with some incredibly skilled fundraising professionals, um, so we were pretty confident we could do it. However, um, as I'm sure everybody on this call is aware, putting on fancy in-person events is an expensive endeavor. So we were looking at spending um, around $45,000, mostly on things like venue expenses, catering, rentals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that means that our net revenue goal for this event was $65,000. Um, but in looking at our virtual event, a lot of things were obviously very different from what we would have done for our in-person superhero social. Um, first, we decided that it was not realistic to sell $100 tickets to an event like this. You know, if we're being honest, the value was just no longer there, like it would have been if we were hosting a cocktail party in person. And so um, we would end up losing most of our audience, which would have been really counter to our goals for this event. So that meant that our revenue strategy really had to shift to focus heavily on sponsorships and individual contributions. Um, we ended up partnering with a couple of local businesses to do some external fundraisers as well. Um, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, but as you can see, our actual revenue ended up being a lot lower than we were planning for at our in-person event, uh, about 25% lower, which is something that we expected to a certain extent, um, but it's always disappointing when you see something like that. Um, however, we weren't disappointed for long because our expenses were also a lot lower, um, to the tune of about 86% lower. We really only had a few major expenses, and so this ended up being a really inexpensive event compared to what we were originally planning to spend on our cocktail party. So as a result, um, we were actually able to exceed our net revenue goal from the in-person event by about 35%, which was awesome. 
um, to dig into some of these expenses a little bit further, the two biggest line items that we had were for contractors, um, in particular our videographer and a local guy we hired to help us with the more technical aspects of virtual event production. Um, given the opportunity to do this again, these would still be my primary investments because they were so critical to making our event look polished and professional, um, and our virtual event producer in particular made our job so much easier. Our other expenses included um, an additional contractor for graphic design, as well as some marketing related expenses, um, live music from a couple of really fantastic local musicians, and printing and postage for our postcard invitations for this event. Um, and that's basically it. It was uh, much simpler than what we would have been looking at for our cocktail party, which is always nice. Um, so I'm pretty sure that everybody is getting a little bit tired of listening to me talk at this point. So I am going to just take a little break here and turn things over to Jamie so that she can get into some details about how we developed our brand for this virtual event. Thanks, Morgan. Um, like, like Morgan said, we did have quite a bit of our budget towards contractors. And I think, as she said as well, it was like a really great way to use our funding that really supported the development of our brand and this event as a whole to begin with. And so touching briefly a little bit about brand and brand purpose, um, I, I think the another benefit was with the theme, with the superhero theme, um, because it appealed to a broader audience, especially with the popularity among the Marvel movies that was happening. With the purpose of a brand, I think we're all familiar with brands and know it has a logo and iconography that's memorable and recognizable. So having this strong superhero brand um, will bring trust to our viewers and the people that want to participate and it develops a true identity to tell a story. So basically you can look at this brand and understand that it's superheroes and thanks to the prominence in everyday culture and superhero iconography, it feels familiar and approachable. Um, and so the support of a graphic designer was very vital for us. And so I do want to just go into another poll now, um, just to see how you guys all are in your own organizations when it comes to capacity. So, here we go. So if you want to take a moment to rate your capacity of what, one, you have no space or time for graphic design and social media. Five, you have uh, several dedicated people to really help with that. Kind of a little all over, which is really great to see. Awesome. So I'm not a trained graphic designer myself. You know, I lean on Google and Pinterest for ideas. So definitely my pro tip is getting some support from a graphic designer. So it looks like everyone is about in the middle. I kind of maybe have the capacity and ability to do so. So that's great. We have a little bit of space there. And so we can reiterate here the importance of this cohesive brand as it allows for more capacity because you can just plug in assets where you need and have to deal with a little less creative energy to think of a new way to look at your um, your event. And so that's what our graphic designer was able to help us with was developing this brand and a brand toolkit. So as we move into our next slide, we can show you a little bit more about what a brand toolkit looks like that can help create this exposure and consistent um, messaging and iconography once again. And so a brand toolkit, here's a screenshot of what the brand toolkit looked like from our graphic designer. And so it includes things like a color scheme, fonts, and other assets that can be used in a variety of ways to stay consistent. This is the initial toolkit we received and how we initially developed the brand. We wanted to continue in this superhero theme and add to it a bit more outside of this color scheme. Um, and so we kept thinking, you know, what are some other iconic, noticeably superhero elements that a lot of us know about? Or just familiar from what we know. And so what about like the bat signal? So here's a Larimer County version of a bat signal, just like Batman, but for us with United Way. This is a scene our designer created to add to our library and features notable Larimer County establishments like Horse Tooth Rock, Stanley Hotel, the Rotary Clock in Loveland, uh, scenes from Old Town and the Rialto Theater. 
so this is just another way that we can continue to move forward on that brand, um, the brand elements and be able to reach a variety of audiences. This is very visually appealing and that is the small gift that we created to show how that's like the bat signal that most people are familiar with. And it was just a great way to continue to talk about that brand exposure and familiarity. So now after seeing all these brand elements in the toolkit, let's see them applied in a variety of formats and we'll start with social media. So here are some of the brand elements we used in social media posts. And so because we had that toolkit, it was really easy to then create, recreate and use it, those toolkit assets in a variety of ways for emails, for social media. Um, here you can see two Facebook posts. Those are the horizontal ones. Uh, the, long, the tall skinny vertical one is for Instagram or Facebook stories. And then the square one in the lower right is for Instagram. And then the smaller one where it says your community, our community still needs your help. That was something we included in an email newsletter as like part of a blurb to keep that um, consistent look and feel throughout a lot of different formats that we shared. This allowed us to stay creative and unique with each post that we shared, but it was still also recognizable because we're still using the same imagery. We're still using that same font, we're still using that same logo, keeping it really consistent, top of mind, um, and just connecting with the theme behind the event itself. So next we'll show you a variety of emails that went out to different audiences as well. Our general newsletters had different call outs that still kept that superhero language, as well as a Women Give newsletter that carried the elements across while still complementing that Women Give brand. So here you can see the different colors that are applied across all the different emails that were sent to different audiences. It's including the different call outs with the, the starburst, it's including the same color scheme that visible or a visual of the superheroes themselves. So it's, again, just staying consistent with that look and feel. So then it's recognizable. It's something that people can trust and understand uh, and get excited about just because, you know, who doesn't love the Avengers or Thor or Batman? Maybe I'm just speaking for myself. Um, but now that we've gone through brand and overall background, I wanted to pause and see if there are any questions in the Q&A box to address before Morgan dives into more about the event concept. As a reminder, please use the Q&A box so that we can address everyone's questions for the end of the session versus in the chat. And so it looks like, uh, yes, we can definitely provide Kevin's contact information, the videographer that um, Morgan mentioned earlier on in um, when we showed that video. And yes, this presentation is created in PowerPoint. And then the Zoom has the polling feature that we are um, sharing here. And so we will have a recording of this training itself, as well as share the PowerPoint as a PDF file as well. We're gonna send an email follow up probably tomorrow to include a lot of that info as well as some other handouts. Great. All right, great. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so now that we have covered our goals and our brand. Um, let's talk a little bit more about how we tied all of that together um, to create our event program. Um, we really wanted to replicate the experience of an in-person event. Um, even though it was a free virtual event instead of a fancy cocktail party, um, we wanted the Invisible Superhero Social to feel as much like a real party as possible. And so we focused on putting together a lot more, a lot of um, really fun kind of pre-event content to share with our supporters, um, like a signature cocktail recipe that we developed with Copper Muse Distillery here in town. Um, we also partnered with Noco Nosh and a few local restaurants to offer delivery food, um, which also served as another revenue source for us, but um, more on that in a little bit. Um, we also structured our program in a very similar way to what we would have done at our cocktail party. Um, we had several speakers, a couple of mission impact moments, um, presented awards, etc. Um, we're very fortunate to have a personal staff connection with a local celebrity um, who served as our MC. And as I mentioned before in the budget portion, we also recruited a couple of local musicians with a strong following um, here um, in Larimer County and also put together some packages of giveaways to attract our viewers and keep them engaged throughout the broadcast. So let's talk through um, some more specifics on the technical side, but first let's do another quick poll um, so we can see whether any of you have used any of the tools that we will be talking about today. Put that up and give everybody just a moment. Mm 
and looks like we've got some responses coming in here, so we'll give it just a few more seconds. It's always good information to have just to help frame our discussion a little bit more. So it looks like a few of the really major tools that we used may not um, have as much experience here with this audience. So I'm excited that we'll hopefully get to share some new information with you. Um, again, you know, if anybody does have any specific questions about any of this that we're going to go over, um, please put them in that Q&A box and we will address those for you um, before the end of the webinar. So I know I've mentioned our virtual event producer that we worked with a couple of times, um, but I want to dig into the role that he played for us a little bit more. If you were able to tune into our event uh, when it was live back in June, you know that we had all kinds of really cool stuff up on the screen, um, like sponsor logos and our current donation total and the names of our donors were scrolling past. Um, there was a bunch of other really cool graphic stuff. I had looked into purchasing some video switching software and trying to figure out how to do all of that myself. Um, but since I don't have any sort of background um, in video or event production, I realized that it was going to be way more effort than it was worth to get the kind of substandard result I was bound to come out with. Um, so instead, we decided to hire Dan Butcher from Proton Creative Media here in town. Um, he does have that background, and he is the reason that we were able to pull a lot of this off. Um, so in addition to those really nifty graphics, he also helped us run the show very smoothly, um, switching back and forth between our speakers and our performers and the videos and other elements that we were using. Um, I really cannot speak highly enough of Dan, and he was a real bargain for us as well, although um, I have to say that he would have been a bargain at any price um, based on the really positive experience that we had with him. Um, another really important tool that we used was Mobile Cause. It looks like a couple of you have used this platform in the past, um, but for those who haven't, I just want to review a couple of pros and cons really quickly. Um, Mobile Cause is a text to give platform, but they do have uh, quite a few other features built in as well, like peer to peer campaigns, event registration, ticket sales, um, and quite a bit else. Um, one feature that they rolled out earlier this year is called the event page, and it was super useful for this event. Um, it basically creates a landing page where you can host an all-in-one experience. Um, so we hosted our event registration, um, linked our peer-to-peer -peer campaigns, and included all sorts of really useful information about the event, uh, from our sponsors to our speakers, um, our signature cocktail recipe, kind of everything in between. Um, we were even able to host our live stream directly on that event page. Um, which was particularly awesome because as people were watching the stream, um, they could click the donate button right there um, on the page they were on and make their gift directly on that page without ever having to leave the stream. Um, so if you'd like to click around our page um, and see th what that looks like and, and kind of how it worked, um, it is actually still up with a recording of our event. Um, and we have a bit.ly link, which is bit.ly slash invisible superhero social. Uh, and maybe uh, Jamie would be kind enough to um, type that link into the chat while we um, move on. Um, it is worth mentioning though that mobile cause is not without its drawbacks. Um, I don't feel like it is the most user-friendly platform in the entire world, so even though it offers a lot of features, um, it can take a while to get a handle on things and figure out how to use them all. Um, we also had to do some sort of uh, complicated customizations and workarounds to get things to look exactly like we wanted them, um, which did take quite a bit of time. Um, so overall, you know, I really liked using this platform and I would absolutely use it again to do another virtual event. Um, but if you do decide to purchase mobile cause, I'd probably recommend getting it as early as possible, um, just so you can spend plenty of time um, learning the ins and outs of setting things up on the back end. Um, and then the last tool that I'll cover here is Zoom webinars. So you're all probably fairly familiar um, with Zoom meetings at this point, um, but we used an upgraded license to access their webinar features for this event. Um, Zoom webinars gives you a lot more control over your speakers. Um, it makes it a lot easier to facilitate that switching back and forth if you have people coming from a few different locations. So I definitely recommend that upgrade for this purpose. 
Um, Zoom will also live stream to multiple platforms at once, and there is a pretty hefty discount available for nonprofits through TechSoup. Um, so it doesn't actually come out to be too expensive. I would uh, definitely recommend for everybody to look into that. So uh, let's run through the actual mechanics of how we got from our speakers to our audience. Um, I know sometimes seeing it visually can help, so I made a little fun flow chart for everyone. First, we had speakers in several different locations during this event. Um, so we had all of our speakers log on to Zoom webinars as panelists. Um, we asked them to keep their cameras on so that we could make sure they were ready to go when it was their turn. And um, our Zoom webinars feed was primarily managed by Dan, that virtual event producer, um, who put all of the cool graphics and everything on top into um, a separate webinar panelist. Um, if that makes sense there. So now, like I mentioned on that last slide, you can embed a live stream into your mobile cause event page. Um, I believe they accept streams from Facebook Live, YouTube Live, and Vimeo Live, although that may have expanded um, since we were using this when they first rolled that event page feature out. Um, so we streamed our webinar out to Facebook Live and YouTube Live. And we were initially planning to embed that Facebook stream into the event page. Um, but we discovered last minute that the Facebook stream was actually not working super well. Um, so we switched it to YouTube and it was much more seamless. So from there, um, the audience could watch the stream in any of those three places, although we were encouraging them to go to the event page um, directly rather than to YouTube or Facebook. So. One of the things that we were not totally sure about as we um, were planning this event was how much staff support we would really need. Um, normally our big in-person events are considered all hands on deck, um, but we knew that that wouldn't be the case for our virtual event, but we also weren't sure exactly how many people um, we would end up meeting. So obviously um, a lot of things with a virtual event are done in advance, um, but there are also a lot of variables and things that come up as the event is happening. So we really stacked our deck and made sure that we had more help than we thought we'd end up needing. Um, we had people ready to take donations over the phone in case that happened, um, as well as a couple of people entering um, some of those, you know, quote, offline gifts and some pre-scheduled gifts that came in prior to the event um, so that our live donation total stayed accurate um, and so those donors' names would be acknowledged on screen during our broadcast. Um, we also had a couple of people who were assigned as um, stage managers, including one who was specifically helping our MC, since he was really keeping the pace of the event and was the main person communicating up-to-date information like our donation total. Um, we also had a couple of people in charge of making social media updates on our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram stories, um, as well as keeping an eye on the comments coming through on the Facebook and YouTube live streams so that we could be engaging with those folks in real time. Um, we also sent text message reminders to people who had registered about making a gift a few times throughout that event. So we had another person managing that and yet another person managing our door prize drawings that we did throughout the broadcast. So you may or may not end up meeting someone um, or multiple someones to fill all of these roles for your event. Um, but my overall advice for you in terms of your staff plan is really to develop a detailed protocol for your team in order to set them up for success. Um, they're not going to have as much knowledge around the mechanics of how the virtual event works as you do. And so really take some time um, to write things out and train them so that they really understand their tasks and their roles. Um, and another tip that I would share is to centralize your communication plan and make sure that everybody knows who they should be reaching out to with questions or updates and where they should be reaching out to those people. Um, we had a Microsoft Teams chat going the whole time and everybody was under strict instructions to only contact me and everyone else who was working the event um, through that Teams chat. I let everybody know um, in no uncertain terms that I would not be checking email or text messages or anything else. So if they needed to communicate something to me during the event, they needed to reach out and tag my name in that Teams chat or I was not going to see their message. Um, and I do think that that was really helpful in making sure that um, everyone was on the same page. So, okay. 
Um, I know that that was a lot of very technical and detailed information, so let's just take a quick pause to answer a couple of questions before Jamie starts telling us about some of our engagement and outreach strategies. Um, Jamie, do we have any questions from our audience in the Q&A box? Yeah, it looks like uh, Lindsay shared that she's used Microsoft Teams live event before. That was one of the other virtual tools that have been used from that list. So she wanted to share that. That's since we're just sharing teams, it's great to know they have a live event feature as well. I didn't know that. Um, and then we had someone else asked if we could share the results of the polls. I think that's a great idea. Sure. Pull that up here. Yeah, so, so yeah, Lindsay, for oh, go ahead, sorry. Lindsay must have been one of those people that selected other and type it in the chat. So does anyone else that had other um, tools that they used? Feel free to let us all know in that chat box as well in case there are other digital tools we're not aware of that maybe could help with these future virtual events. All right, perfect. Well, let's go ahead and move on. Jamie, if you wanna tell us about engagement and outre outreach strategies. Yeah, thanks, Morgan. Um, so now we have a brand and we have an event concept. So we had to now talk about how we're going to engage people and get people to actually register and join us for the event. We saw examples of our emails and our social media. So we're going to talk about how we actually use them and implemented them. We were able to segment our communications for our affinity groups like Women Give, our Leadership Giving Circle, and our loyal contributors, as well as our nonprofit partners. Some of you on this call may have received some of our email campaigns, I'm sure. Um, so when contacting these different people, we adjusted the language to speak to these people directly. For example, when we're emailing our loyal contributors, these are the people that have donated to United Way every year for 10 years or more. So we know they are committed supporters. We are able to speak to them in a way that is grateful for their ongoing commitment and long-term support and calling them to once again, join our League of Superheroes to strengthen our community. And that's where we're also still incorporating that brand aspect, that superhero brand, by using the language like our League of Heroes, um, but still staying true to who we are with that recognizable uh, tagline of strengthening our community. So we are able to still incorporate that kind of language throughout all of our uh, segmented emails, as well as really encouraging people to register. So when planning your emails or communications around an event, it's great to share something new and exciting or engaging to keep the interest and to keep people wanting to open the email as well as to register for the event. Um, if you consistently are sending just the same email each time, there's not really any new info to think about or want to, that actually wanna make you register. And so while we did an email every week for four weeks, each email was true to the brand, but also introduced something new and exciting to look forward to which I mean, at the time, it was something we all kind of needed. It was kind of at the start of COVID. It was at the start of the Black Lives Matter movement and George Floyd. And so keeping some of that positive options and communications out there, despite all that was going on around us, was really great to continue to engage with our audience. Um, some of the other things we'll touch on a little bit later in this training, but each week we also included a new giveaway announcement just for registering or a new partnership like with Noko Nosh or the Copper Muse signature event cocktail feel. So while we regularly communicated with our most dedicated audience through our newsletters, we also wanted to reach out to new people. So that's where we leaned on our partners, like people like at the chamber, our city, other agencies or business supporters to include a digital invite for the event. This helped us reach a new audience or maybe it served the message another time to somebody who's already received it from us. And so it's another re reinforcement and a way to remind people as well as increase the reach of our event. This is a broader concept in advertising called reach and frequency, but basically the more times a message is served to someone, the higher the ad recall or the more likely they're going to remember it, they're going to think back to it and more likely to potentially register for it. So having a higher reach and a higher frequency of your message will really help drive home the event itself. And lastly, everybody's favorite, social media. There's so much that we can do with social media these days. I'm sure we're all very familiar with how prominent social media is and not only in our personal lives, with our, our personal scrolling, but also as an organization, how vital social media can be to engage with your followers, to share vital resources and information, to build a, com this, a digital community that now we all live in. 
So this is where our brand toolkit really helped with creating a variety of assets to keep it engaging instead of just posting the same photo each time or just throwing up the event and leaving the event on Facebook and assuming people will follow it. So part of our sponsorship fulfillment included dedicated social media posts for our sponsors. We'll get into the sponsorship strategy in a little bit, but this is where um, working with our sponsors and our community partners helped to increase that reach again. So leading up to the event, we would share different posts acknowledging our sponsors. We kept the language of these sponsor posts aligned with our superheroes while giving them the exposure that they deserve for the um, generosity they've given to this event. I also want to encourage that when you are posting about your sponsors, you tag them on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. That's where you do a little at symbol of ampersand and tag their band, their brand, and uh, it'll become a hyperlink to go to their page. It's great to tag your sponsors because this once again increases your reach of your social media posts without having to put dollars behind it. If you're not necessarily that familiar with social media um, like strategy or um, just the algorithm behind it, but the way that Facebook and social media works is that as a brand or as an organization or a business, a lot of your posts don't really reach a lot of people unless you're getting more of that organic engagement or if you're putting dollars behind it and paying to have it served to people. So by tagging one of your sponsors, your partners, um, people that are involved in the event as a whole, it notifies that business and that partner to then have that business share it on their page and then it's, and it's part of their, um, the feed on anyone that follows that brand as well. So it just helps to get another free way to have greater reach in the social posts that you're doing, since we all know that social media can take time and energy, and so we might as well get the best, of we, the best we can out of it. And so then we saw also on the poll how people are kind of in, in between on um, their capacity. And so I think I can actually go back and share the results from that poll too. And so I wanted to share these were the results from the poll about the capacity each of you all have within your organization to support social media and graphic design. So a lot of us look like we're falling in the middle here. Uh, yeah, kind of, kind of, kind of have capacity, kind of can do this. Um, and so I did want to share some free resources that you may or may not be aware of. So some of these free digital tools. So short form videos and GIFs are really awesome on social media and really engage a lot of people, right? I think a lot of us have seen these things where, you know, the short videos, the GIF, where you're kind of moving back and forth and it repeats and they're kind of funny. Um, that bat signal we showed earlier is, it, is technically a GIF with the bat signal flashing and on repeat. Um, but so then here are a couple links to make some GIFs on your own that are really user friendly. You can upload just photos to rotate. There are apps like the Boomerang app where you, where you can make them. Um, one of my bullet points got taken away here, but the branded links are there to use bit.ly. Uh, bit.ly is also a free resource. Oh, I got a little mixed up there, sorry about that. Uh, but bit.ly is that great free resource that's available too to make that branded URL. And that again, that just kind of goes along with all of your brand consistency and messaging. And then when we were using mobile cause, the URL to go to was really long. It was like mobilecause.com slash U, Q, W, and a bunch of numbers, right? And so no one's gonna remember that. And you'd have to be able to only copy and paste it. So by using this free resource of Bitly, you're able to then have a recognizable, memorable URL for people to go and register and still participate in your event. So these are just a few of these different um, options you can use if you don't have access to a graphic designer. So since this was a virtual event, digital promotions were vital and people were home and online much more with COVID. So posters and flyers didn't really make sense, but how can we reach our supporters in another way besides digitally? You know, once again, giving that touch and reaching out a little bit more. Um, so, you know, how we talked about our loyal contributors those people that are diehard fans and supporters. Since we know these supporters are by our side for the long haul, we reached out to them specifically with a postcard. And it was a nice way, once again, to get the message out and more than just a digital ad that was served to them or another email that ended, landed in their inbox. And again, you know, knowing the digital landscape we're all living in right now, consistently in front of a screen, there's just so much that's right in front of you. How can you remember every message that comes your way? So adding in that added postcard was really helpful to continue to encourage people to join us. In that same vein, we had that personal outreach from our staff, like Morgan was sharing with our incredible resource development team, being able to reach out directly to the people that are your greatest supporters and inviting them to join is another great way 
um, to reinforce the message and reinforce the brand. One thing we created was a social media toolkit for our partners. And so even though some, some of our partners were in a position to sponsor or be a sponsor, we were able to provide a social media toolkit to be like, well, you can't, you don't have to be a sponsor, but you can help us spread the message. And so we've provided this toolkit, which we will also include in our recap email um, for people to share on their own feeds to invite people. That is another way to continue to spread the message. Mention those new announcements throughout, like things with No Konash and Copper Muse. We also gave those guys a social media toolkit to help promote our event as well and to reach their community. Um, having these community partnerships just once again expands your reach and your audience of new people that may not know who you are or not know your organization. Leveraging these intentional community partnerships really helped us get the word out even more and engage with their followers. We also submitted a press release to our media partners. And so once you have that press release, you're able to talk about your event concept, having some of those unique elements like the celebrity MC or the local musician really helps that story get picked up and attract interest. I think it also helped at the time that since there was a lot of negative news or just hard news to hear, maybe something nice like a superhero social was a nice way to mix up the news segments that were going on at the time. Again, this was in June, and so it was late May, early June that we were really promoting this. Once that press release was picked up, we were then able to connect with radio stations for interviews or PSAs, PSAs or public service announcements, um, or even having radio messages to continue to spread the message far and wide. I want to take this time to also just remind people too, as a nonprofit, reaching out to some of these media partners, like a radio station, like your press, local press, um, they want to help advocate for the impact we're all making in our community and some tend to be pretty receptive to wanting to support with these free ex this free exposure on their outlets as well so i know we just went through a good amount of engagement and outreach and so we can take a moment here and just pause and check out if there's any other questions here in the um q a box jamie it looks like somebody here um is asking samantha is wondering um her organization is wanting to do a hybrid virtual auction, um, and she is curious about whether anybody is familiar with the Handbid app. Um, and I am not um, familiar, as familiar with that app, particularly not from the organization side. Um, but I do believe that um, the Book Trust actually uses that um, and has been using it for a couple of years. Um, so you may uh, hop onto their website and uh, see if there's somebody there that you could reach out to um, because their development people might be able to give you a little bit more information um, about that um, and help you to get that information. Um, but thank you so much, Jamie. You know, you really did do such an amazing job with our outreach and our engagement for this event. Um, I just felt like you used so many creative strategies and it really, um, it really did pay off for us. And uh, speaking of getting paid, um, let's spend a little bit of time talking about our fundraising strategies. Um, so we were anticipating that it would probably be harder to raise money at a virtual event um, than an in-person one. And so we decided to layer a few different strategies to shore up our efforts and increase our chances of success. Um, so we'll go through each of these in a little bit more detail, but in terms of the overall breakdown of our revenue sources, um, you can see that the majority actually came from sponsorships followed by individual contributions. Um, we also had a couple of external fundraisers that we'll touch on in just a bit as well. Um, so first, given how much of our revenue came from our event sponsorships, I really cannot emphasize enough how important they are. A lot of folks think that businesses won't want to sponsor a virtual event, um, but we really did not find that to be the case. Um, it is absolutely possible for you to adapt your existing sponsorship package to a virtual event and successfully solicit event sponsors. And I'm betting that you will not have to change nearly as much as you think. Um, Price-wise, I would encourage you to keep your packages pretty consistent with what you're currently offering. Um, obviously, keep in mind whether you'll be removing a lot that would decrease the value, but um, we really did not experience a lot of pushback in terms of our prices. Um, so don't undervalue those sponsor packages that you're offering. Um, the big thing that people are not going to be getting when they sponsor a virtual event is the physical signage or logo representation in the event program, things like that. Um, so think about how you could create a digital alternative for those things. Um, for example, you know, that on-site signage becomes a rotating logo that plays on the screen during your broadcast. 
Um, you can also offer more of certain benefits like social media exposure or, you know, sponsor spotlights on your um, organization's website in place of the benefits that you have to remove from your package um, because you're making that switch. Um, another thing that we um, had to change was table sponsorships. So if you're doing a virtual event, especially if it's free, um, you are taking away what is basically the main benefit of a table sponsorship, um, which is those free tickets to your event. So we ended up removing the table sponsorship option and replaced it with a bronze level sponsorship um, that had some other benefits that we weren't previously offering. Um, and then one other tip um, for adopting those sponsorship packages, um, we encourage you to consider planning an in-person follow-up event for a future date um, to be determined. You know, like a thank you reception for people who donated during the virtual event. Because um, this not only allows you to add back in some of those in-person benefits, it also extends your timeline for those deliverables, and it allows you to increase the value of your packages for your sponsors, um, which I think is a really great selling point. Um, so now I'm going to turn it back over to Jamie to talk a little bit more about how we adapted our sponsor strategy and some of the benefits of doing so. Thanks, Morgan. Um, like Morgan said, you can create uh, more value in a sponsorship for something like this. And so for us, we incorporated things like, um, well, here you can see we diversify the ways you provide exposure, like Morgan was saying, and extended the time frame, and more ways that you can connect with your community, like with the variety of options of in-person and virtual. Um, on the next slide, Morgan will show how we change the, you'll see side by side the before and after of how things happened with our sponsorship packets. You can see on the after, it's much longer. There's many more assets there. And um, so what we did is we provided more social media posts over a longer time frame. These are an easy thing that you can add in because all you're doing is scheduling once again within your communications plan. And you can have the way that you post it and the copy that you use to cater to your own brand messaging as well. So for example, if one of your sponsors is a huge supporter of one of your programs or they internally have um, a wellness program, you can acknowledge how they are, they also align with your mission by doing this and they align and their mission aligns with yours as well. So you can provide that value to your sponsor by, in aligning together with these added social posts. Also, like Morgan said, having different blog posts, creating a blog post on your website that is dedicated to this higher level sponsors. This creates content not only for us and our website, but it also creates content for the sponsor so they continue to spread the word about the partnership as a whole. So when I say a blog post, though, I don't say that it's like a salesy post all about said sponsor. It is a more of a catered and specific blog post that is about the partnership, the history of your partnership, the work that both of you have done together or the work that this organization and this sponsor has done that is, aligns with your mission. Um, one of our great sponsors over time has been like, like, like Nutrien and Nutrien has always been involved with our Make a Difference Day and volunteerism. So when we have a sponsor post for them, it will align with their commitment to our community as it relates to volunteerism in the community. And again, aligning with our brand tagline of strengthening the community. When we um, secured those radio interviews, we also did invite our title sponsor to provide that added value. So when you do have some of these surprise things pop up, like a PSA or radio interview, like a news media mention or things like that, it can be another added benefit to include for your sponsors. Um, this is for our title sponsor. They were able to participate in this radio interview that aired live as well as recorded, which we then were able to share again in social media on our pages as well as a sponsor page. Uh, so there are challenges to doing this and not all sponsors are excited to sponsor a virtual event like they were in uh, sponsoring a person event. Doesn't mean that it's not valuable, but now Morgan can show how even though it's turned virtual, there was still a lot of great movement with our sponsorship strategy. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure that everybody um, is curious to know exactly how well um, we did with this adaptation process. Um, so I do want to acknowledge, um, you know, this is not going to be the same for you as soliciting sponsors for an in-person event. Um, compared to our 60th anniversary celebration, we did experience a pretty significant reduction um, in both the number of sponsors and the dollar amount of the revenue that came in. Um, however, that does not mean that nobody is going to be willing to sponsor your event. Um, you know, we actually had 10 new sponsors come in for this event um, that had never sponsored an event for United Way previously, um, and that included our title sponsor. Uh, which was really cool. 
And so I just have to emphasize, you know, one more time that despite that reduction, um, sponsorships still accounted for two thirds of our gross revenue for this event, um, which is a pretty big deal considering that we also exceeded our overall net revenue goal by 35%. So, um, you know, if I could send you away with one piece of advice, um, it is to make sure that you focus a lot of time and energy on this um, so that you can get the results that you're looking for out of your sponsorship solicitation. So next, let's talk about individual contributions. Um, this was the second largest ge revenue generator for us, which we were really excited about. Um, we had a lot of concerns about this um, just because of the state of the economy. Um, but what we found was that folks who are in a position to give really want to give because they want a way to help out. Um, so again, you know, really lean into this strategy and don't let that fear of failure hold you back from making these asks. Um, since we were no longer selling tickets to this event, we had a lot of ground to make up there. Um, so we really focused on getting as many people as possible to tune into our broadcast. And once we had them watching, you know, we could use our program to inspire them to make a gift, even if it was just a small one, um, but we would not have that opportunity if they weren't watching in the first place. So we wanted to get as many people to watch as possible. And once we had that audience in place, um, we used a few different strategies to convert those viewers into donors. Um, first, we spent a lot of time and effort securing a challenge sponsor who would contribute a match for donations that came through at certain points during our broadcast. Um, we call those challenge periods. You know, we were lucky enough to receive that match from one of our extremely generous longtime supporters, and it was very effective. You know, if you've ever run a campaign with a match before, you know that there's something about doubling the impact of a person's contribution that is very motivating to donors. Um, so I definitely recommend this strategy. Something else that we did was to employ virtual table hosts. You know, we all know that table hosts are a huge part of making an in-person event successful. They invite their friends to your event, um, encourage them to make a gift, and when the person on stage makes that big appeal for donations, they pick up their big white envelope and look expectantly around the table at everybody they invited. Um, we didn't want to lose out on that just because we were going virtual. So we looked for ways to keep that social motivation going, um, just in a virtual way instead. And Jamie will talk a little bit more about this in just a moment, but um, the short version is that we still ask our most loyal supporters to invite their family and friends to tune in. Um, instead of a big white envelope, we set them up with a personalized fundraising page and ask them to participate in a peer-to-peer -peer giving campaign in the two weeks leading up to the event. Um, and then finally, you know, going back to what I was saying a couple of minutes ago, make sure that you're really driving home the message that your virtual event is still a fundraiser. Um, this is not the time to go all low key and get shy about asking for money. Um, you don't have to be pushy, but you do need to push and you need to remind everybody to make a donation several times throughout your broadcast. Um, this is especially true since people might be coming or leaving at different times unlike an in-person event where you have a more or less captive audience. Um, with a virtual event, that old sales acronym ABC, it rings very and literally true here, um, you should always be closing. And one of the biggest successes here um, was that our average individual gift was pretty on par for what I would consider to be the norm in this area um, at about $109 per person. Um, so now let's hear a little bit more from Jamie about engaging viewers and maximizing those donations. So still sticking with our superhero theme here, we assembled our League of Heroes and established our virtual table hosts like Morgan shared. Um, we not only did they support fundraising efforts for those two weeks leading up to the event, but they also did help recruit more people to register and attend. On the next slide, Morgan will show a screenshot of how our virtual table host site looked with mobile cause. And so we gave these virtual table hosts all the tools they needed to be successful fundraisers for us, as well as community superheroes in their own right. We provided once again another toolkit for these guys, which we'll share about share after the event with you. Um, so if you're interested in trying that too. It's basically like when people set up those Facebook fundraisers, but instead it's our own branded site and program. So the idea here was like, donate to my page here and help me meet my goal um, leading up to this event, let me be a superhero. And so we provided in this toolkit for them 
um, social media assets so they can continue to post on social media and share their link. We provided some examples of emails that they can send to their friends and their network to get their friends to sign on and join in on their League of Heroes as well. Uh, we kept playing with that superhero language as well just to make fun, have fun with it and keep it exciting and engaging. Um, but outside of the table hosts, we gave more reasons to tune in to hopefully get more donations. So our table host, hosts help get more people to register. Once we have these people registered, um, we were able to have uh, door prizes. So not literal door prizes because we don't have a door, but if you registered for the event, you could receive a door prize drawing. And in addition to that, you can gain more chances to win this drawing if you made a donation. So anyone who registered would get would be entered to win essentially and then if you donated you'd have more chances to win we were able to get some of these um donation giveaways from some of our sponsor partners as well as part of our budget to buy some of these giveaways as well since you think about how much we save like morgan showed in our budget in terms of execution we were able to take some of that budget to provide actual valuable giveaways to make people really interested, right? Like if it's a good giveaway, you're gonna really wanna sign up for it. So it was another way to draw people in. And they also helped enhance that at-home event experience. Same thing with these varying speakers and musical guests. We had two musical guests that were local uh, music artists that had their own following that attracted new viewers as well and made people wanna sign on and listen. The music was played um, for free, right? Like the, people can tune in for free and so, in theory, you could think that, you know, I'm getting this free musical experience, maybe I should be contributing some money. And I do know that our musical supporters uh, also spoke of that while they were performing or when they were having breaks between their music. So once again, engaging their followers um, and engaging their supporters as well. Great. Um, so our last fundraising strategy was around external fundraisers. Um, although this was not a major part of our overall plan, it did generate some revenue um, and have some other pretty major benefits, so we wanted to touch on it real quickly. Um, we did two of these. So one was partnering with NoCo Nosh, um, which if you're not familiar is a food delivery app here in northern Colorado. Um, they gave us 10% back on delivery orders during the event um, and for a couple of hours kind of before and after. Um, we also partnered with a few of the individual restaurants that are on their app to do an additional give back on top of NoCo Nosh's contribution. We also worked with Copper Muse Distillery here in town to create a signature cocktail recipe um, that I had mentioned earlier. So we posted the recipe on the event page and shared that out on social media and in our email newsletter. Um, but Copper Muse actually also sold these as cocktails to go um, over at their location in Old Town and donated a percentage of the sales from those back to us, um, which was really cool. So even though these fundraisers were not necessarily huge revenue generators, at least compared to our other two strategies. Um, they were still a key part of our overall event strategy. Um, and Jamie, do you want to just share a little bit about um, what those partnerships were able to accomplish for us? Yeah, so it is a, from a fundraising perspective, it's a small effort, but it definitely adds to the experience while also reaching new people to join. So if you're going to these, if this was an in-person event, you would be having that nice fancy meal, you would be having that signature cocktail. So how could we still allow people to bring that home? Um, some people maybe aren't, aren't keen on food delivery all the time, so here was a great opportunity to take advantage of that and know that you were doing some good in your community by getting some food delivery and spoiling yourself for that night. We were able to support these local business communities too during, this, during COVID and as everything was happening with restaurants closing and then being able to open again. And so being able to have that local touch also helped support our community and then reach these new followers as well. And in the same vein, we wanted to create that atmosphere of an in-person event. So we added cute things to this, like the cocktail. Um, and we also had a Zoom toast with our MC while he held up our signature cocktail. So here's a nice video of our, all our staff. And we had a nice cheers together to add to the event because if we were all together in real life, we would be cheersing and celebrating all the superheroes in our community. So that's a little bit on those external fundraisers and the way that they were able to um, enhance that virtual experience so that we can make it a little bit more than just watching a screen and getting people a bit more engaged, whether at home or with their friends. 
Um, it doesn't look like we have any more questions at the, right now, but now we can at least jump into some of the lessons that we've learned of what went well and what didn't. And so Maureen, do you wanna start us off? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's uh, focus on the positives first, um, what went well. You know, first I um, said several times today, and I'll say again that our sponsorship strategy was a really big win for us. Um, I won't keep going on about it other than to just reiterate that you should really, really take the time to develop and execute a strong sponsorship solicitation effort. Um, another thing that went well were those giving challenges with our matching gift. Um, you know, it really is motivating for potential donors, and so I would absolutely do that again in a heartbeat. Um, next, I would for sure hire a virtual event producer again. Um, this was one of the best decisions that we made and the value of what Dan brought to our event um, really exceeded the cost. And so if you're skipping the in-person event, um, you know, you've got some budget to spare. And so I would just highly recommend that you hire a professional, get the job done right, instead of trying to DIY all of that technical stuff. Um, and Jamie, do you want to tell us about a couple of other strategies that you'd recommend to the folks on our webinar today? Yeah, I would definitely want to add on to what you shared about Dan, our virtual event producer. I mean, we were talking about capacity earlier when it relates to graphic design and social media. While Dan isn't a graphic designer, but he does have access to some of those graphic design tools, it was really thanks to him that we were able to add all of these really cool elements on the screen, like our logo, like that countdown in the upper right corner, like the little superheroes and the rotating logos, right? Like it was thanks to him and his ability to do those to make that branding really available during the, throughout this event again. And then I still would wanna go back to our postcard invitations. Cause again, adding that added touch, it kind of just shows that you care and you're thinking about them a little bit more, especially with those loyal contributors. Um, our strong MC, Tom Hilbert, and he's pictured right there on the right. He was so great and engaging throughout. This was all his idea where he popped on with, um, uh, Captain America costume and at that time as well that was during one of our giving challenges that's why that countdown is happening in the upper left corner above him but he was saying how man I barely had enough time to change in the telephone booth and that's probably because there's no telephone booths around so he's still able to be pretty funny and engaging while still sticking with that superhero theme um, even though Captain America doesn't jump in the telephone booth to change we can all still find the joy and funniness in that <laughs> especially during a virtual event and then again, our community partnerships, where would we be without our community? Where would we be without our um, biggest supporters? I can't express enough gratitude for the amount of support we received from our community members and our community sponsors and Oko Nosh and Copper Muse. You know, it's a true, a true community effort to really make this event as successful as it was. And so that was definitely something that went very well for this program uh, and definitely encourage everyone to work with their community partners as well. Absolutely. I totally agree. Those were huge strengths and I just still cannot get over how funny Tom looks in that outfit, Jamie. Um, <laughs> so let's um, talk some turkey now, everybody. Um, what are some of the things that didn't go so well or some of the things that we would do differently next time? Um, for starters, you know, I probably would choose to extend the length of our event um, just a little bit to give us some breathing room. Um, you know, we had an event that was only scheduled for an hour, but we really had a lot that we were trying to accomplish in that time. Um, the difference between, you know, an hour and an hour and 15 minutes um, isn't necessarily so much on the viewer's end, but when you're balancing a lot of those different event elements, it can make a pretty big difference. Uh, another thing that we found out was that we did not need nearly as much staff support as we had anticipated. Um, we had quite a few people on deck um, ready to go, and um, several of them ended up just needing to kind of kick back and enjoy the event. Um, this was not something that was necessarily unexpected. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you know, we were really trying to cover all of our bases and make sure that we were prepared for anything. Um, but the reality of how things shook out was that we just didn't need as many people as what we had ready. Um, now this next one is pretty funny and if you watched the event live, you probably know what I'm going to say. Um, everybody should be expecting some technical issues and I think we're all relatively used to that by now. Um, but we did have a bit of a doozy coming right out of the gate. Um, our first speaker, who is our lovely, very professional and well-spoken board chair, um, had horrible feedback on her mic and couldn't figure out how to stop it for almost three minutes. 
Um, so we'll spare you the noise from that, but suffice to say that it was not a very pretty sound. Um, and, you know, looking back, I think I would have actually pre-recorded all of our speakers um, and everything else except for our MC, who was providing those live updates throughout the event. Um, we actually ended up having to pre-record our musical performances at the last minute um, because the sound quality was getting squashed when it came through Zoom during our dress rehearsal. Um, you know, Zoom was fine for our speakers, but it clearly wasn't really built for live music. Um, we worked with them. They were great. Um, they, you know, could respond, quote unquote, respond to the people who were introducing them um, and still kind of create the feeling of that live experience. Um, and honestly, I think it would have been really easy for us to do that. That, um, with the rest of our speakers as well, um, which would have given us just a little bit more control um, to ensure that our final product was a little bit more polished. Um, that said, though, don't get discouraged if you do um, experience those technical issues during your event. Um, like I said earlier, I think most people pretty much expect them by now. Um, and plus, you know, during that three minutes that Tracy was struggling with her mic, um, we brought in a ton of donations. And it was one of the most lucrative three minutes of our entire broadcast. So, um, you know, were those pity dollars? Yes, probably, but um, I'll take them. You know, pity dollars look the same as all of the other ones once they're in the bank. So we were happy with those. Um, and Jamie, I know there were a couple of other things that you would do differently as well. Um, could you just share a little bit about those? Yeah, I think the virtual table host recruitment and strategy is a great idea. However, I, we should definitely um, move that up in timeline if we do that again. I think it would have it would have been more successful if we were able to provide a bit more um, direct training and support to our virtual table hosts instead of just the email and here you go, here's how you do it. You know, it was a pretty long toolkit and, I, and not being able to actually speak to them face to face and kind of talk through how it works and to really support them, um, I think helped made it a little more challenging. So in the future, I would definitely move up that timeline to connect with table hosts, provide a bit more training and connection to get them really set up for success. Um, I think we would also eliminate the giving incentives and giveaways. I think we're all familiar with giving incentives, like if you donate $50, you get this branded hat or something, right? Um, I, I just wouldn't invest a lot of time or effort in these things. They're nice to include, but certainly not necessary, especially if capacity is an issue. I mean, we did have these people join us for giveaways, which was incredible to be able to recruit more people, but it wasn't necessarily the full selling point, right? And same thing with the giving incentives. We made it an option when you made a donation, you could select, yes, I want my the giving incentives. And more often than not, people did not choose the giving incentive. So um, just something to consider if you are planning to have those same sort of elements in your virtual event. Um, but I think from here, we can now open it up for questions. And so if anyone does have any questions, so we are coming to the end of our training here. Um, just as a reminder, we will be sending a follow up email to probably tomorrow and it'll include a recording of this training, as well as this PowerPoint deck. And we'll also include um, someone asked for Kevin's contact info. Um, he was our videographer. We will include that as well. Uh, and then we have um, the social media toolkit for reference in case you're interested in making a social media toolkit and a how to for a virtual table host and our contact information. Great, so if anyone does have any questions, again, just go ahead and type those into that question and answer box and we would be happy to um, address them. You know, they can be general questions or something a little bit more specific to you. Um, we're happy to help any way we can. We'll just give it a few minutes in case anybody's got something that they're typing in. Looks like Lori has got a question, uh, maybe for Jamie. Did we do a blog for fundraising? Um, maybe I don't understand the question fully. Um, we did not like a blog about fundraising, like asking. Um, 
I mean, we did not do a blog for fundraising, meaning we did not write a blog about how we fundraised. We did not write a blog for um, anything like that. Our blog was only about the event itself and what it was for, what it was about, what to expect, and what we were fundraising for. So if that's um, what you were thinking, Lori, I can um, include a link to that website poster we had too, and it basically just outlined the theme of the event itself. Um, kind of an agenda of what was going to happen, what to expect, and a, bit, a little bit of our goals. And Lori, if that did not answer your question, um, I just uh, unmuted you or allowed you to talk. So if you'd like to unmute and clarify a little bit um, to get a more specific answer, um, please feel free. No, that was a great answer. I appreciate it. Perfect, perfect. I'm glad that um, we were able to address your question. Um, does anybody else have any questions? All right. Well, it seems like we might be out of questions. Um, so we will go ahead and just leave it there, I suppose. Um, we want to thank everybody for attending our webinar today. Um, we hope you learned a lot. You know, there will be a um, short anonymous survey that will come up on your screen when you leave our call. Um, so we would really appreciate your feedback if you have um, 15 or 20 seconds to spare. Um, and we'll also, as Jamie mentioned, um, be sending out the slides today, as well as a link to the recording and um, a few other resources that we hope you might find useful. Um, if anybody does think of any follow-up questions here in a bit, um, or if you, you know, want to talk over your event specifics um, in more detail with Jamie or I, um, please feel free to reach out. Our email addresses are here on the screen. Um, we're happy to help you as much as we can um, and hopefully, you know, get that revenue flowing for our Larimer County nonprofit profits so that we can continue to sustain um, that important work that we're all doing. Um, so thank you again for joining us, everybody, and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody.